Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our podcast from the Kama Sutra to 2020, where we look at your questions, your concerns, even your worries around all things to do with sex and sexuality. So today, I am delighted to introduce my guest, Dr. Simi Sachdev. Simi is not only a a really dear personal friend, but she is also the most brilliant consultant psychiatrist. She's actually a fellow of the Royal College of Psychiatry, so it tells you how brilliant she actually is. Um, Simi deals with, she practices general psychiatry, but at the moment um, she is dealing with borderline personality disorder patients. And Simi, I'd like to welcome you to our podcast today and tell you what a joy it is to have your expertise with us today. Thank you so much, Seema. Actually, it's my privilege to be here with you. I have always been a big admirer of yours and to be actually being, you know, be sitting here and talking to you and talking about things. I think I'm the one who's privileged. Oh, this is so amazing. So everybody out there should know that we both love each other dearly, as you can tell. (laughs) And this promises to be an amazing session. So Simi, talking about your specialty where you're dealing with borderline personality disorders, today I want to actually speak to you specifically about the guilt and the shame that people feel around their sexuality, around desire, around arousal, around feelings of pleasure, and what it does to their brain waves, what it does to their mind when they feel like that. Do you come across a lot of people um, with this kind of problem in your work? Yes, I do. And I think we'll have to categorize it a little bit, uh, if you don't mind. We have the younger generation who have never had sex, maybe have sex for the first time, feel the arousal, uh, get intimate, and then feel guilty about it. Then you have uh, the middle ones where they're not married, but in a relationship and uh, they want to have the sexual relationship, but because of cultural taboos, they have restrictions and worries whether they should or they shouldn't do it. And then you have the married ones who might be quite happy with their partners and would want to either experiment a bit more or they might go in for an extramarital relationship. So it's a whole gamut of things that we're looking at when we talk about guilt and shame. It really is, isn't it? And the the strange thing is, of course, it's the common denominator, no matter what age group you look at, because at every age, this has been so fed into our brains that it's bad. It's, It's a dirty thing. And honestly, the people writing in to me will write about everything. They'll say things like, Um, we like to use bad language during our lovemaking. It gets us very excited. Is that a bad thing to do? Are we doing something wrong? Or somebody will say, I have such and such fantasy with my husband. We like to do it. But is that sinful? Is that against God? I even had one girl write to me. And I know I laughed about this because it was the way that it was worded. But it made me also feel really sad because she said to me, so she's quite young. She's not yet married. And she said, Is it okay to be kissing somebody because I don't want to do something wrong because I truly love God? And I thought, it's okay. You can kiss somebody. God is not going to mind. So, I mean, this is what surprises me a lot. Maybe I might be speaking more in context of the Indian uh, Indian, uh, culture. But if you were to look back into history, mythology, and you are the expert in that, if you look at any of our temples which show uh, the gods, the the female and the male god together, and the postures that they're shown in are so much more expressive than what our society has become now. Because of years of cultural suppression in some ways. I think that's a really good term, actually, cultural suppression, because our culture has been suppressed and we are now living through somebody else's cultural viewpoint, aren't we? Yes, so, absolutely. And yeah. I think there's also this a lot of misinterpretation of religious texts 
and I'm, I just don't mean one of the religions, I mean all of the religions, they are sort of going more towards uh, sub subjugation of the woman rather than empowerment of the woman. And that is why I always feel that women are the ones who feel a lot more guilt when it comes to sexuality as compared to the men. Because it is accepted that a man can be, uh, he might wander from the marriage and the woman will be blamed for it because she did not provide what he wanted at home. So it is culturally accepted to do that. It is okay for a man to have sex before marriage, but it's not okay for a woman to do the same thing. And youngsters believe that, oh, if this girl is kissing me, she's easily available. Whereas, do I want somebody who's willing to do that? Or do I some, want somebody who's more homely later on? So there's a, there's a lot of cultural implications, religious implications that go with all of these things. Yeah, it, and it's terrible. The double standards are absolutely yeah. awful. So let's start with the older age group first. I'll tell you why, because I, I recently was part of a panel um, for the Anglia Ruskin University, hosted by the British Science Festival, which said, sex never gets old. Basically talking about the fact that uh, the for people as they get older in years, how beneficial it is for them to continue to be sexually active or to continue to enjoy pleasure and desire and intimacy because it's great for them at so many different levels. But, you know, you were saying that there's a lot of, um, there's still a lot of problems attached to that. There's all this guilt still that comes with it. So, yes. So what I've noticed is that, um... You know, initially when you get married, you are trying to sort of fit, get to know each other, fit into a kind of a mold, uh, try to discover life, setting up your life together as a couple. Then you have children, you're trying to be a couple with children and you're more of a mother and father. And then it's only later on that you are more able to look at intimacy in a different fashion. And what I often find is that couples at times quite struggle, especially when the children are not there anymore, to look at each other in that sexual way, because you almost have a few years where sex has not been such an important part of life. And uh, suddenly you want to reinvent the whole thing. And uh, at that point, you revisit some of the things you might have wanted to as a youngster or as a young couple. And you wonder whether should we think about these things now? And should I tell my partner about this now that I this is what I want to be done or this is what I like? And people struggle with it a lot because as, as again, it's, it's all about how we have been brought up in our culture to not express sexuality, sexual gratification as an acceptable means of fulfillment. It Particularly is some, by the women particularly by the women, that is right. And I think even men to some extent, like uh, for example, uh, somebody might, uh, a guy might be watching porn, for example, because it, he likes it. And he might want to watch porn with his wife, which is absolutely acceptable, but he might not feel comfortable asking his wife to do so. And, you know, people coming together sexually or in an intimate fashion when they're older is so looked down upon. I always remember that film called Badhai Ho, where huh, it's a yes, much older lady yes, who gets pregnant. Absolutely, and absolutely. Everybody's like, oh my God, you know, that class of people and so on. It's just considered such a bad thing. So just- You know, so my, my knowledge about mythology and the mythological words is not very good. But you know, uh, one once when a person gets older, it is called vanaprastha. Mm -hmm. The vanaprast, yeah. Yes. So vanaprast is when you are supposed to give up any... Uh, um, everything. Everything exactly, and 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 it is expected that by the time you are 60, 65, you would be at that stage. So you are not supposed to have these feelings, which I think is absolutely ridiculous. Why not? Not everybody has to follow those feelings that that are there. People can be at different stages in their lives. 
And what's worse, I think, is that as um, Anvita, you know, the um, the lady Anvita, Dr. Anvita Madan Behel, who I do this with otherwise, um, as she was saying a couple of times that as men get older, a lot of times their sexual capacity can diminish a little bit. Sure. We found from the emails that come to us that a lot of women say, I'm trying to approach my husband. He can't do very much. So instead of saying, I can't do this, but we could try something else. It's easier to put her down and make her feel guilty about even asking for a, a sexual context or, you know, some kind of intimacy, because then he has to put himself out and say, well, oh, actually, I can't do this. And my arousal is not that strong anymore. Uh, and yes, and that is that is very true. Uh, and that tends to happen. I think women tend to discover their sexuality much later in life as compared to men. And I think it's a lot of experimentation. And then there's this whole taboo around masturbation. While men are still, it's acceptable for the men to masturbate, but it is not acceptable for a woman to masturbate. And as women discover their own bodies and their what brings them pleasure, they want to express that to their partner but then again there's this whole thing about whether can i or can i not so you know that's where the struggle is and and, and like you rightly said that men might change how they go on as they get older in my experience women find their sexuality later and enjoy it a lot more later and men do it a lot earlier. So there is that kind of discrepancy. And then if both the partners are able to talk about it, you can still have sexual intimacy without intercourse. It doesn't have to be about intercourse. We've said this over and over again, that it's not about penetration, that there are so Absolutely. many different ways of coming together and being together. but. It, this is also another one of those myths that been, that's been fed into our brain that this yes. is what it is. It Absolutely. starts with this, it finishes with this, and that's it. True. So anything outside of that box becomes something to feel guilty about and Absolutely. be fearful about. Absolutely. So just before we move on to the next age group, what is your advice, Simi, for the slightly older age group of people listening in? What is, I mean, and I'm sure that this advice extends to other age groups as well, but is there something that you can suggest to help people get past their, their guilt, their fear, their hesitation? I think the most important thing is communication, being able to be very open and honest. And I think that is what we all struggle with, that, you know, if a woman is not feeling in a mood, but the man is, and that the woman feels obliged that I have to do it rather than saying no today I don't feel like it or vice versa as well so I think communication is the key especially in the later age group because your desires might not be at the same level and let's not forget that women have their menopause and men have we don't have anything called as a male menopause as such but their libido also gets affected as they grow older so communication is very, very important that you talk to each other, you are able to communicate to each other what you're feeling, what you want. And I think that solidifies the relationship even further. Yeah, I agree. And I think that I always find that I say to people that, okay, you know, if you feel that it's something that you and your partner, you and your husband or you and your wife are doing together consensually, one, stop feeling guilty about it. And secondly, if you feel that somebody else might judge you for it, don't tell somebody on the outside. Yes, absolutely. And uh, intimacy anyways has to be a very personal thing. You never need to discuss it outside of, besides the two people that you are. Of course, uh, younger people tend to do it because it gives them a sense of empowerment. They can show off. But when you're in an older category, you don't need that kind of uh, uh, validation. Validation, yes, that that was the word I was looking for. Yeah, I think that. Um, so, I I definitely agree with you that instead of feeling guilty, actually, it's something that people should be doing. We've always said that pleasure, uh, sexual pleasure, intimacy is it should be like chocolate. You should be able to enjoy it for your entire life. 
but you'll only enjoy it if you really enjoy it. You know, it's like so, if you yeah. don't like chocolate, you're not going to want to eat it. So uh, shall I just uh, interrupt a little bit and sort of split it into guilt and shame? Mm -hmm. So guilt comes when you are trying to judge yourself by somebody else's standards or the societal standards. And shame comes in when you have a certain belief and you are going against that belief as well. Okay. So you feel shameful about it. So it's a very complicated dynamics. And then you have guilt and shame together, which is even more complex to deal with. My God, yeah, I never thought of it like that. Yes, so shame is when you're judging yourself by your beliefs or what you think that society has created around you as beliefs. Yes. So if they have said, I mean, like so many people write to us and say, if I've been to the temple in the morning, is it okay to have sex with my wife in the evening? Yeah. And something somebody has put in your head that if it's a festival or you've been to a prayer meeting, that you shouldn't be with your partner in the evening. You're married. And it's, interna partner. it's internal internalized so much by all of us. Like, um, I mean, I still know people in this country who have been born and brought up in India and the children are here and they still believe that when they are on their periods, they should not go to the temple, they should not touch religious books. And mm -hmm. I mean, uh, for me, that that's my bugbear, but that we will revisit some other time. Mm -hmm. But it, it is something that has been internalized by us, all of us to such a large extent, you know? So that's where the shame comes from. And the guilt comes from the fact that what if somebody else comes to know about it? Because it's considered such a dirty thing. So yes. instead of saying, yes, this would be wonderful, it's considered such a dirty thing that you don't want other people to know. And it's so complex. Like you said, it's just, it's like you're, you're in a little whirlpool. This is mm. one thing that would make you feel, it should make you feel amazing. It should drop your stress levels. It should make you feel um, good about yourself and energized. But instead, we bury ourselves under layers of guilt and shame and the complexities around it and make Absolutely. it worse for ourselves. Absolutely. Okay, so moving on to the slightly younger age group, the middle age group, do they have it any easier? It depends. So let's look at it in two different ways because Indian society, if, if you're look, focusing more on Indians, is changing very rapidly. We are seeing more live-in relationships. We are seeing more love marriages that don't end up working out. We are seeing arranged marriages that do work out or don't work out. And if you look at all of these different kinds of dynamics that we have, the sexuality of all these dynamics is very different. So in a live-in relationship, there is an aspect of sexuality that goes along with the live-in relationship. So that these are people, uh, this is more in cosmopolitan cities, I would say. I could be wrong because I haven't been to India in a long time. So I may be wrong. It might be happening in, in uh, villages and smaller cities as well. But my experience is more of about cosmopolitan cities. And people are living in a lot more than they used to when I was a youngster, I would say. And uh, there is two parts to it then. Some people accept living together absolutely all right, whereas there are other people who are completely against it. So you might find that these kind of people would have difficulty even renting a flat in a place like Bombay because they're not married. So that's one of it. Then let's go on to the love marriage. So you find somebody, you are attracted to them, both the parents agree, you get married, and it doesn't end up being the dream that you had, especially if you have not had sex before marriage. So after marriage, you might discover that it isn't what you expected it to be. It could be great, or it might not be that great. What do you do then? And then yes. you have the third part where you have the arranged marriage, where you don't know each other at all. And there's an expectation that on the first night, the husband will have sex with his wife on the first night. And how difficult is that? 
uh, I would say for both the partners, I will not say it's only for the woman, but there's an expectation that it has to take place. And I don't know whether you're aware, but in olden days, they would look at the bed sheets to yeah. see with the signs of virginity. I think that a lot of people still do that. I hate to say this, but there is still this myth that they have to check for the blood on the, on the bed sheet. Yeah. But unfortunately, in all of this, the, like you said, the middling range, I find that, I mean, I, from personal experience, from just you know people writing in, this is the group that seems to be going through the biggest amount of problems around guilt and shame and fear. Yes. Because for some reason, so like you said, you know, if the marriage doesn't work out, you're single and you have a child. So as a single parent, you are not, society expects that you won't have any kind of sexual feelings at all. Absolutely. And then you have a lot of women feeling very guilty because it's like, oh my God, you know, I really want to go out. I really want to have a little bit of sex. I feel like I really want a little mm. bit of pleasure, but what will people say? Am I doing, the, doing a bad thing? Am I setting a bad example for my children? Mm. We have true. all of very that. True. Very true. So how does one deal with that? I mean, what would you say if one of those people walked into your clinic? I would like to give a very simplistic reply, but it is never that simple because it is not just years of cultural conditioning. It is centuries of cultural conditioning that we have to fight. And I am very open about my views about sexuality. And my view is you don't have to have a committed relationship to have sex. It is absolutely fine to have a one night stand. It's absolutely fine if it works for you. You have a kid, you don't want to be in a committed relationship. You want to have a one night stand. You find somebody attractive in a pub. You, ha you have that one night stand and that's absolutely fine. Or you might want to look for a new relationship and you want a commitment in a new relationship, which is also absolutely fine. It is about what works for you as a person whether you want the sexual connection, whether you want the emotional and sexual connection, or you might even just want the emotional connection without so much emphasis on the sex. Yeah. So, there's, you know, every person is different. Yeah. yeah. Because sometimes you want more companionship rather than sexuality. Sometimes you want a mixture of both. And sometimes you just want to have sex, which is all right. But I guess when the moment you say, oh, I just want to have sex, suddenly, for some reason, all the flashing lights go off. I think that particularly with women, we tend to talk to our friends more. Yes. So I'm not sure how guys are, whether they will go and chat about their emotions with their male friends. I know that as women, we tend to talk to our friends mm -hmm. a lot. And I know that if a woman comes along and says to her group of friends about, oh, I really fancy so-and-so, I want to go out, et cetera, that'll be fine. The moment she says, I really just want a couple of one-night stands just to get back in the game, you can see the judgment going up. And these are the women who are writing in and saying, I feel so guilty. Am I doing something wrong? Am I doing something bad? I think they need to change their group of friends. <laughs> All right. because, or maybe we, need to, maybe we need to educate the group of friends. Absolutely. And absolutely. They would be listening. Yes. That, uh, I mean, I don't know why people always club sexuality and love and emotion together. Why can't people accept that they can be two separate things in itself? And I think women tend to be more judgmental than anybody else about other women. Unfortunately, that is such, the, such a sad truth. It is. And while the, they, they might be best of friends uh, at, and they would want that person to get married or get into a relationship, but when it comes to talking about a one night stand, they will have double standards. Yeah. And that's where the shame comes up for the woman who is in that position, because she's talking about something that she really wants, but 
the situation is such that she, she's, she's going finding, to be judged. She's going to be judged. Not only that, uh, uh, the, the other issue is that, uh, you know, it takes a lot of guts to say that this is what I want. I don't want anything more than this. And there's an expectation that women should not be wanting only sex. So she's already judging herself for it. So she's already feeling shameful about it. And then she talks to somebody else who makes her feel guilty about it. Yeah, well, God. And the fact that having wanting sex for sex sake is fine. Yes, but absolutely. We are fine. made to believe that it isn't. Yes, exactly. And I, I just think, you know, every time we talk about this, it's almost like going around in circles. You keep saying, it's okay. It's all right. It's okay to actually have that desire. There is no reason why you shouldn't. But yes. it comes back to it every single time. But is it all right? Oh, but so-and-so will think this. Oh, but what will I answer back? You know, it's just... It's, but, it's a, but I think we, we, we are so culturally conditioned to think about the society, to think about what other people are going to think about us as women and possibly some men too, uh, especially when you are in, in a, a, a gay or a lesbian relationship, you are just so con culturally conditioned to think that it is wrong, that you yeah. cannot seem to separate that sex is a natural physiological desire, whereas love emotions are something completely different. And both of them do not always have to match. Sometimes you might find that, or some people might find that they find a more emotional connection with somebody else rather than their partner. And they might have a perfectly lovely, loving sexual relationship with their partner or vice versa, where they will have a very emotionally satisfying relationship with their partner, but the sexual satisfaction might come from somewhere else. And then is it infidelity, emotional infidelity, physical infidelity? What do you call it? You know, there are various terms that we give it that trying to justify what we are feeling. I think we always refer to that as sort of changing the contract, you know, because when you have two people who are together, um, who, who feel that if, if this is how they want to be, like the partner that you're with might be the person that you're emotionally attached to, but the sex is better with somebody else and you really want that fulfilling sex, then instead of going behind somebody's back, you should really have that as an open conversation. In a lot of the modern marriages, I find people are a little bit more open to it. Not everybody, obviously, a little bit more open to it. But in terms of somebody who is not married, let's say you're single and you have a committed relationship with somebody who is like a boyfriend, a partner, whatever you want to call it. Hmm. And even over there, there is this guilt because like I said, you know, with one person, it may be that, you, so it, it, I find it acceptable if somebody says, I feel very close to this person. Um, with my partner, the sex is great, but my emotionally, I want to go to this person for, for my um, emotional needs. And that still is acceptable. But if it was the other way around, again, people feeling guilty. Is it the wrong thing to do? Is it the right thing to do? And you know what? It's not just, I was just thinking of um, an incident. So I was watching, you and I both live over here in the UK. And I was watching one of the um, the Apollo theater comedy, stand-up comedy, uh, comedy shows. And there was this particular UK comedian talking about going out at night and meeting this woman in a pub, in a club, sorry, not in a, in a pub. And it's two o'clock at night. And then he says in the middle of his uh, routine, and then he discovers that she's got a little child, that she's got like a four or five year old kid. And he's like, what the hell was this woman doing out here in the middle of a club, picking up a man at two o'clock at night? Why isn't she there with her child? And, you know, I still remember cringing and the entire audience was laughing and saying, yeah, that's right. What the hell is she doing out here? And I was thinking, my God, it's not just that it's culturally embedded in us, but 
we reiterate it. We make sure that that identity never changes so that guilt and shame never goes away. Yes. And hence and we, that when control. we are so judgmental, we are just, and uh, I mean, like you said, that this was a stand up comedian in UK. I was thinking I was talking more from an Indian perspective, but it exists over here as well. Yeah. And, and again, I think there's also this sort of a perception, I could be wrong, but if a woman is single and has a child, there's almost a feeling that she will be more available, if you know, in that sense, yeah. Yeah. that she will not want to that have That she's emotion. desperate. Yeah, yeah, which is very unfortunate because being single is not something somebody chooses to be, it happens life happens it could be death it could be divorce it could be a bad relationship and you walk out of it it takes a lot of courage to do that and after that you're being judged for being the single parent as well yeah it's just um it's such a messy like i said you know this is a, a session i've been wanting to do with you for a long time because it, it, it's just so deeply ingrained the guilt and the shame um, and the fear is so deeply ingrained and I just feel that the more we talk about it the more it brings it to people's forefront of their mind and hopefully it'll start to normalize things and Absolutely. these conversations are so so important so now let's move on to the younger lot now I know that as you're growing up when you're younger you know your hormones are changing the hormones are up the excitement is there. The blood is up. Come on, we've all been young at one point and we know how exciting things can be. And the fact that the guilt and the shame that is put upon everybody, they're made to feel that they're doing the wrong thing. How can we help to change that mindset? And this is literally, I had this young uh, man write to me. So this is, they were um, a youngish couple in a live-in relationship. And he wrote to me saying that his girlfriend had asked him during their um, sexual experience, she had said to him that the next time she wants to try something called a facial finish, which is where she wants the, uh, the, the boyfriend to come on her face, basically. And he wrote to me saying, I'm horrified that, you know, girls are watching porn and coming away with all these wrong ideas. And you should try and explain to women that they shouldn't do things like this. I would never want to do this because it's so demeaning to her. And my first reaction was to think, oh, he's being so caring. And then I, you know, as soon as that suggestion settled in, I thought, no, he's being an absolute control freak because she said, She's obviously picked up the courage to say mm. exactly what she would like. And she's yes. being made to feel that yes. she's doing something bad. Yes. And I think that's where the problem is. Because, again, uh, we do not provide our youngsters with adequate sex education, adequate understanding, and the whole idea of consent and respect, which especially uh, being a mother of boys, I think is very, very important that they understand that it's consent and it is respect and that that is what has to be communicated. As Indian parents, I think we don't talk enough about sexuality. We sort of let it be that they will get the education from their friends, they'll get it from school, the school is doing sexual education, let them handle it that way. And or they'll watch porn, which we then complain about and say, exactly. oh, how terrible. But yeah, they'll go and see it over there. Yeah, exactly. And I think we we are guilty in some ways as parents for not having a very frank conversation. Uh, sometimes, like, uh, for example, I would ask my husband to have that conversation with my youngster, whereas I could just as easily have it, but he will not feel as comfortable talking to me about it. Yeah, so, I don't know. I think we've always had this thing and yet I find, yeah, more, it, it's just really difficult for parents, a lot of parents to do that. Yeah, I and, always, and, and my concern always is that then they learn things from their friends, which, might not be the right thing at all because the friends might be talking in a very disparaging way about another girl in the same group that they are in 
and that would then be accepted as a norm because this is the macho guy in the group who is having sex with this person and then he's talking about how easily she's available and then it just becomes a norm and that's where the lack of respect comes in then and we're perpetuating the narrative exactly. by not actually having this conversation although exactly. i have to say that the sex ed that they teach in schools is fairly useless because they basically point out the different parts of the body and they say yeah. this is what goes into this um, yes. and i just think that there's so yeah. much more to sex i mean i think that there should be classes on emotions and desire absolutely i completely agree with you because as a teenager not only are you changed uh, dealing with your uh, physical changes that you go through but you start having uh, crushes or you start having emotions at 14 15 16 years you have crushes and you don't know how to handle it nobody knows how to handle it you don't want to no. tell your parents about it you're not able to tell the person that you have a crush about it and when things don't work out you feel miserable desperate and and if you indulge in that for whatever reason you feel guilty and you feel ashamed yeah. that oh my god why did i do it it's just like a world Vicious circle yes yeah 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 so i find that this is one of the leading causes it seems to be one of the leading causes of mental health um you know bad mental health poor mental health through this this whole idea of sort of suppressing your desires feeling guilty about it because it's so natural we all think about it we all feel guilty about uh, we all um, think about it we um, we all feel it we all want to do it and then the guilt creeps in Mm. and then you start feeling shit about yourself mm. and and What especially as do? a youngster you tend to feel it a lot more because you've got facial hair you've got pimples uh you've got uh, you know generally or, or for a girl uh she might not have breasts or she might have too big breasts and you know the whole thing about how i look is so important and when there is rejection at that point it just makes it even more significant because suddenly it is not just what you were thinking but somebody has just said what you were thinking is right because you about, have low about all your your so called yeah. bad points yeah yeah so you have low self esteem as you're growing up and it, it every teenager goes through that identity crisis and then somebody doesn't support you so that reaffirms that i'm not good enough yeah and this is something then you carry on for the rest of your life absolutely and it will impact your sexual relationships for the rest of your life absolutely absolutely and i think that is why it's very important to talk about emotions not just sexual education but about emotional education that you know i think schools are not doing enough of that and we are not writing enough about it uh, the media is not doing enough about it to normalize the fact that you can feel attracted as a youngster to somebody else it's normal it is normal to not be accepted and it is normal to be accepted as well i mean of course there are television series which show some aspects of these kind of things but not everybody watches those series no so and i think they're very far removed from reality most of the time yeah yeah so there is always i mean tv shows are all about perfect in that sense or imperfectly perfect in some sense whereas and life also is not there's that. always um, there's always like a resolution by the end of that half hour episode exactly so it it really isn't very real and and life doesn't have that resolution most of the times no but i liked what you said that you know that the emotional education has to include not only the fact that you'll have infatuations and crushes and that it's okay to not be accepted it's very normal that that desire will not be reciprocated yeah. and i think if we could make people understand that it won't stop the hurt but it'll yes. stop the long term trauma 
exactly and i think we all have to accept i mean you have to accept i have to accept we've had our crushes in our days and we got over them and we went on with life and everything else but a couple of them so i have children... to tell you have left very deep scars still oh. same here so let's not go even go <laughs> there but what i'm saying is we don't even after that we don't want our children to go through that whereas that is a fact of life every child will experience it but we yeah. still want to put cotton wool around them and make sure they never feel like that but it's not going to happen so the only thing you can do is be present for them so that you can hold their hand when they are going through that kind of emotion i find a lot of young girls who write to me say oh you know i really like so and so but i don't ever dare tell my mom my mom will kill me if she finds out or you know my brother found out that i um, i was in a relationship and now he's calling me names and and i'm thinking my god it's the most natural thing in the world exactly. to feel like that exactly be there for your child Absolutely. they will otherwise turn to somebody else on the outside which yes. could be a lot more detrimental yes and absolutely it can create a lot of borderline personality disorders yes absolutely and that is why i mean i i would always tell every parent that as your child grows older they will become more and more reclusive but still you have to still be the one going into the bedroom saying the good nights giving them a hug and a cuddle asking about their school day it might be they'll say everything is okay yeah it was good yeah that it was fine you know that's what teenagers do but you still have to go in there and reiterate that you are there that if there's anything that comes their way that they are scared about that they don't feel they can handle you are going to step in and you will help them with it so you will not change it for them you will help them deal with it so you very empower them yeah you empower them you don't do it for them you empower them to do it themselves just to know that you have someone that you can turn to it's a huge huge um, thing i mean the fact that you know people write to me who is like a disembodied voice where they can't go to their own parents for the same mm-hmm. thing i think it's really sad but the amount of guilt and the amount of shame and the amount of fear that people feel for feeling arousal mm-hmm. forget about doing anything just for feeling the arousal it is so sad to think how many people out there are going through the exact same thing and they have no one to turn to and they're still being made to feel that what they're doing is wrong so i think that and i think if you look at it you know like as teenagers especially if you look at boys they would have uh, morning ejaculations which yes. is a very normal thing they don't know it's normal they will feel guilty about it they might feel aroused looking at a girl and then that will come with the guilt oh my god what am i doing so mm-hmm. it has to be normalized that these things are normal yeah so tell me something to me as we sign off um is there some kind of advice that you'd like to leave everybody with around how to shed the shame or the guilt so one little practical piece of advice that you could give everyone talk 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 communicate talk to the person that you care about whether it is a father or a son mother or a son mother or a daughter father or, or a daughter whether romantic relationships partners lovers husbands wives older people who are parents just communicate talk frankly i think we don't talk enough in our culture yeah i think that a lot of the guilt that we take on is actually in our head yes. if they did talk to somebody maybe the other person won't even be judging them in quite the same and way and it might be normalized but we assumed yeah yeah because somebody else will say oh even i had thought the same thing i mean if i were to say oh i find rithik roshan really hot 
and you say oh of course i do too and then it's all normal it's fine to ogle at him isn't it yeah. <laughs> i'm sure he'll love it but just an example okay i mean i could go for george clooney as well but that's another matter altogether <laughs> but it's it's i'm just giving an example that it's okay to fantasize about or uh, sort of look at Things. celebrities and think oh they're so hot whereas when you bring it down to a normative level it suddenly doesn't seem right yeah when you bring it down to real life suddenly it's like no 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 this is all bad but if it's yeah. a celebrity on a screen it's okay yeah so yeah great advice talk 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 you never know when the other person suddenly responds and says that's perfectly normal and suddenly yes. your guilt would dissipate Absolutely. i think that's really great advice i do hope that everybody listening out there will take this home with them and they will actually try it and i i really really hope that after having listened to dr semi sachdev that it is something that you will take on board and help yourself with because even if you can help yourself 5% to reduce that guilt and shame within you you will have reduced at least 50% of your stress levels it's quite incredible the way that that particular formula works Absolutely. Sami, thank you so much for joining us problem. today and so for talking for to everybody. Thank you so much for asking me to join. So, um everybody out there, I hope that you've enjoyed listening. I hope you found it useful and if you have, do please comment, like, subscribe. Uh I am on info.sima.anand@gmail.com. Send your questions in as always. And Sami is on in case you get need to get in touch with her for either a consultation or for advice she is on doximi which is spelled d o c s i m m i at gmail.com but don't worry if you didn't get that because it'll be in the description below take care of yourselves there's still the threat of covid out there stay safe stay very careful and we will see you over here again next week bye bye